Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Hello, welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink Podcast. My name is Anne Vaughn. I'm the Senior Advisor for Climate Change in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And today I'm very excited to be joined by our special guest, Dina Esposito, who is the Assistant Administrator for the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and serves as a Deputy Global Coordinator for Development for Feed the Future, the U.S. government's um, Global Hunger and Food Security Initiative. She's also USAID's first ever global food crisis coordinator, but has deep roots in the agency because we um, could not have asked for a better person during this time of global food crisis. Um, she's, I think this is your third time coming back to USAID, um, but has uh, decades of experience now working in humanitarian and development assistance. So we're super lucky to have you and thanks for joining the podcast. Well, thanks for having me, Anne. I am delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be back at USAID for the third time. I've been here about 12 weeks now, and I'm a dev- delighted to be on The Kitchen Sink. Great name, by the way, for the podcast, and looking forward to talking about food loss and waste. It's a critical part of our agenda, whether we want to talk about food security, whether we want to talk about nutrition, economic growth, climate. It intersects with all of these really important priorities. Great, thanks. Again, we're so glad to have you here, Um, and especially coming off of last month's climate conference, um, where you and I both were in Egypt at at COP, um, where USAID showed up in a really concerted way to highlight our efforts to address sustainable food systems um, and galvanizing climate finance uh, and mobilizing private sector partners to really advance the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security's climate-related goals and core objectives. Um, and it was exciting to see that there wasn't only an agricultural theme day at COP, but there were six pavilions on food security and really a huge emphasis on food systems. Yeah, I mean, it was really exciting to see these twin crises elevated together. There's a global climate crisis, there's a global food security crisis, and the two of them are just completely intertwined. Uh, to say a word about the global food crisis, of course, we know that a lot of the challenges we're facing are due to these triple threats of COVID-19, which has really hurt livelihoods, disrupted supply chains. We have conflict, including Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which has hurt uh, the ability for Ukraine to produce and export, but has also had major impacts all over the world. And then, of course, climate change. You have only to look in the Horn of Africa, where you have five consecutive failed rainy seasons, really an unprecedented series of uh, shocks to that community that is creating 20 million people in need of life-saving food assistance, many of them women and children, of course. And then you can look elsewhere in the world at a place like Pakistan, one third of the country underwater in recent months due to uh, enormous uh, monsoons and and, uh, rain runoff that is uh, also affecting food security there. So these two things are super interconnected And food loss and waste really figures largely because when you're having trouble growing more food, you obviously want to capitalize and save every morsel of the food you are growing. And it's sometimes hard to incentivize that when food is plentiful and inexpensive. Now we have an opportunity in the term, you know, thinking about never wasting a good crisis (laughs) to advance change that we already know is urgently needed, but expediting, accelerating it through both our global global food crisis response and in our global food systems transformation agenda. So I really do think that food loss and waste centers squarely on uh, both the long-term and short-term agenda. And it's kind of a time, it's an issue whose time has come. Dina, we'd love to hear your vision on that. That is, it's, it's really exciting. And again, the opportunity couldn't be more, um, more urgent. And especially, I think one of the things um, that especially working closely with the Center for Nutrition in your bureau, um, the importance of, of of how we are losing our nutrient dense foods, everything from foods, uh, fruits, vegetables, and dairy, are are really often highly perishable. We have countries that lose you know a huge percentage of their their fruit and vegetables before they even get to market, um, and it, it, the losses are just frankly astronomical. 
um, and they equate to about one out of every four calories in the world intended for people to be eat or lost. And that could feed two billion people, which is is pretty pretty shocking um, and a huge opportunity. Again, as you were saying, um, for some change. Um, and then we and how this relates to some of the work on Ukraine and, and Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, if we think about the food systems in that area, Russia's uh, the, both. Um, IFPRI did a really good analysis that looked at agricultural exports from Ukraine and Russia and found that, that produced about 12% of all the calories in the world. Now, if we think about reducing food loss and waste, if we reduced food loss and waste by just 25% globally, that would put 12% of the world's calories back on the world stage. So there's a huge sort of urgency for action, I think, in, in, in reducing food loss and waste. And then on the climate side, on, on, on my favorite topic, um, uh, with mitigation efforts, if we uh, totaled all the different emissions from food loss and waste, it would be the third largest emitter country because it's about eight to 10% of all G GHG emissions come from uh, the food loss and waste uh, wow. problem. Yeah. Those are really powerful statistics. There's another one uh, that we often say, 30 to 40% of all food grown in the world is, yes. is, is lost yes. or wasted, which um, you just creates such an opportunity when you think about the potential there yeah. to, to feed more people. The Biden-Harris administration has really prioritized global hunger crisis, as well as food loss and waste within that, and global food systems transformation. You saw at the UN Food Systems Summit last summer, an announcement of a $60 million award over five years to reduce food loss and waste as a centerpiece of our Feed the Future Global Hunger Initiative. And we also received supplemental emergency resources from the United States Congress bipartisan support for development resources as a supplemental, which is quite unusual yeah. in response to a global emergency. But in the case of the global food crisis, it's very, very clear that there are underlying systemic problems that only development dollars can tackle. And so food loss and waste is also being addressed through that supplemental. We have some pretty exciting uh, work also going on in the Bureau. I am relatively new, but I was happy to see the energy around it. This podcast by the Center for Nutrition is obviously a great initiative to shine a spotlight on the work that we're doing and the urgency of it. We've also launched a community of practice that mm -hmm. brings together our research teams, uh, our universities and research institutions around the world, yeah. our missions, yeah. our aid experts, to talk about collaboration partnerships, where along the food system we need to really prioritize our efforts to make an impact faster than you know we might normally want you know expect in a sort of slower incremental uh, phase of work right um, so we also have a few upstander missions these are missions who have said you know we'll no longer be bystanders to food loss and waste we want to be there taking action and we're providing technical support to them and it's a great initiative to see the enthusiasm around the world on this topic yeah no it's um I couldn't couldn't agree more, and really appreciate the missions that have sort of jumped in with two to both feet um, into to working on these issues. And I think as we look towards the the future, other things will continue these efforts, um, which are are pretty enthusiastic or pretty they're pretty significant as they are. But there's two things I think looking ahead in 2023, we've got um, some opportunities. At COP28, we've we already we've talked a little bit about COP27. That there's a lot of focus on food and food loss and waste there and food systems. It's going to only escalate and be more attention paid in COP um, at, at the 2023 and with the UAE COP presidency, um, focused a lot on food security. So that's that's exciting and an opportunity for us to continue to elevate these efforts. And then secondly, something that's just come out that um, we're excited to to share more with a broader food loss and waste community once once this report is finalized. But we know the importance of getting specific about country action. And if Pri's just done a study for us, it really looks at the data on how reducing food loss and waste can actually increase economic development. Mm -hmm. um, so just as one example, in um, Nigeria, the analysis showed you could increase GDP by 1% to 2% if you wow. decrease food loss and waste, um, I think at half. And that you can also decrease poverty and hunger by 4.4%. Now, we want to address food loss and waste for a whole host of reasons, but that, that those numbers will get a Ministry of Finance um, official pretty excited and be able to make some of the policy changes um, mm -hmm. and support some of the activities that we're also working on to really advance to make sure we get more food in people's belly and more livelihoods and jobs. I was actually just on the phone with our Tanzania mission, 
and they've been talking about the horticulture work that they're doing. They're investing heavily in horticulture and saying that actually, you know, with all the investments in getting uh, farmers the access to inputs, resources they need, 50% of all of the horticulture crops that are grown are lost. Yeah. And they see really exciting opportunities to invest in, uh, in cold storage, transportation, value add, processing towards sorts of things that have sort of a triple whammy, right? right? It puts more food on the table. There's more food available, more nutritious food available. It creates greater income for farmers, but it's also creating jobs all along the value chain. So, and they're pointing out that a lot of the uh, efforts in, in this area are very um, tied and uh, linked to opportunities for women and youth. Yeah. Which, you know, growing food is, our goal is to grow food both more sustainably, but to have the food system also be more equitable. Right. So food loss and waste also is kind of a nice entry point from that perspective. And I know that you know much more than I do about the food loss and waste portfolio. And I just wondered if you might say another word about our work with women and youth. No, sure. Um, and, and kudos to our podcast organizers. We've had a great session, a great earlier um, uh, uh, podcast on some of the work we're doing in Ghana with women. And then we've done a, a lot of work because youth are, are on the front lines of food security, both as, as uh, producers and as consumers of food. Um, and so we've, we've a lot of our programs have touched on working with youth. And one of the things I just wanted to flag, it's, it's a new study that will come out soon. It'll be published in our Food Loss and Waste AgriLinks um, month that we ha we're having in December. But just to flag for the broader community and also for, for, your, for your information, how we might be able to help in address some of that inequity. Because when we've, uh, there was a, a good study done um, by our food Feed the Future Innovation Lab for food processing and post-harvest handling that worked with some of our Kenyan partners worked with over 300 youth and had a 20 odd youth groups that were a control group and 20 odd that were a treatment group who were working um, to try to become sort of more entrepreneurial and help address some market gaps that were the producers faced in reducing food loss and waste. And what we found was when you gave youth uh, bags, like hermetically sealed bags and some other um, um, useful technological tools to sell, the youth that had more money to start with or were better placed to start with got about 75 bucks back a month, which is a pretty good increase. But those that started from a lower place kind of only made t uh, $10 more a month, which is a pretty significant gap. And if we're trying to look at equity, how do we really lift all boats going forward? Um, so it's an exciting sort of effort for us to lean in on and think about equity when we engage in food systems and not just help those that may already have a motorbike, but how do we also build those entrepreneurial skills? So exciting things to sort of look at and make sure we're really doing and pushing on that equity issue. Well, I think, uh, as you know, when we were at COP, we really celebrated uh, the locally led adaptation principles that we're committing to, not just in our food loss and waste work, but uh, across the board. And the uh, focus on women and youth, I think it's not just intentional programming, but to t intentional research and analysis to understand whether we're benefiting that particular segment, what more we can do to do that and what is the most uh, important thing to do to maximize return on investment. So that's just a great example um, that I, re I really like. You are a climate advisor and you know a lot, not just about adaptation, but mitigation. And I wanted you to say a word about our efforts around food loss and waste as it relates to climate mitigation. Um, I love talking about methane, <laughs> which is one of the most dangerous greenhouse gas uh, um, greenhouse gases. And then just to, to sort of give a quick a primer for some of the audience who are not as obsessed with, with um, climate mitigation, methane is emitted when food rots in the field, in transportation, to markets, when you know you have food uh, also sitting at markets and then sort of uh, uh, is wasted there. And then also what my seven-year-old daughter does all too much is not eat everything that's on her plate and things get thrown away and they get, um, methane is emitted when food goes into um, landfills. Mm -hmm. And according to the IPCC, methane accounts for 30 to 50% of global warming. So what's happening right now, but one at positive aspect of methane is that it's pretty short-lived. It does a heck of a lot of damage, but then it, 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 it kind of goes, it goes away. Um, it disappears in about two decades. Um, so if we can really address this extremely dangerous gas right now, cut our, our food loss and waste and a whole host of other things that contribute um, to methane emissions, it buys us more time to get to some of the other greenhouse gases that we also need to decrease right now too. Um, and it's something that we're excited um, 
to, to work with around the Global Methane Pledge, which the U.S. has been leading on and we now have over, I guess, 120 countries who've signed up um, to try to decrease uh, their methane emissions by 30 percent by 20 uh, from 2020 levels to 2030, which would really save us a, a lot of um, a lot of time in dealing with the, this crisis. Um, so let me stop, get off my methane high horse <laughs> and turn to you for Fair some enough. final thoughts on uh, maybe some of the triple yeah. wins that you mentioned earlier yeah. on food loss and waste. Well, first, I just love this initiative of trying to um, help those folks who are focused on food loss and waste to feed more hungry people, yeah. but those folks who want to address food loss and waste because of the um, mitigation opportunities there. And bringing these two themes together, I think, is really part of our mission as a bureau and what we're looking to do within the Global Hunger, um, Feed the Future Global Hunger Initiative. The, uh, food loss and waste fits very squarely in that whole of government agenda, which is focused on sustainable and equitable food systems, increasingly seeing a, a well-nourished population, especially women and children, um, as well as a more resilient community. So again, a nice centerpiece food loss and waste is to the global strategy of the U.S. government under the Biden-Harris administration and of this bureau. I would sit just yeah, close again with this, uh, this notion that never waste a good crisis, right? We know what we need to do. We know we need to move beyond incremental crisis uh, response to a much more accelerated response. And food loss and waste is low-hanging fruit, if I could use that rather appropriate metaphor, I think, right? It improves nutrition and food security. It improves nutrition for uh, nutrition and income for smallholder farmers, but also for people all along the food system supply chain. It can be a force multiplier for job creation. Yeah. We talked about value add and processing, transportation, storage, that sort of thing. And it's a great entry point for uh, improving equitable access to food and incomes uh, and a fair food system for women, women and youth. So I just want to acknowledge the um, amazing work of the Center for Nutrition and other folks here in the Bureau, along with all of our partners, from implementing partners to research institutions to public uh, and public organizations and, uh, and the national governments that we work with. And a special thank you to this podcast, to the Kitchen Sink for having me. Great, Dina, thank you so much. We're so incredibly happy to have you here um, leading this effort and, and helping us address all of these multiple crises, but it's an exciting opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the U.S. government's global food security initiative, and the USAID Center for Nutrition.